Dear Gearbox, what the hell happened here? Borderlands is a looter shooter role playing game franchise that currently has four major entries Borderlands, Borderlands 2, Borderlands the pre sequel, and now Borderlands 3. The franchise also had a spin off series with Telltale Games, which received mixed reviews. The other main installments, however, have garnered immense following, specifically Borderlands 2, which burst the franchise into the mainstream. I remember playing Borderlands 2 as a teenager, likely a couple of years after it was released. It was great fun, and upon hearing that Borderlands 3 was being released in 2019, I played through Borderlands 2 again with my current group of friends. It still holds up to this day, seven years after its initial release. I couldn't tell you how the game was at launch, but hell would have to freeze over before I believed that it was as close to as bad as the release of Borderlands 3. Which is a shame to say, really. There isn't really any other franchise quite like Borderlands. It has cell shading for a unique art style, wacky and whimsical characters with diverse personalities and compelling backstories, along with guns. Billions of guns. You would think that with seven years between now and Borderlands 2, and five years between now and the pre-sequel, that Borderlands 3 would be the big AAA success that we always dreamed of for the series. So I'll ask again, what the hell happened here? I'm honestly baffled that a game series of this popularity, with developers like 2K Games and Gearbox behind it, would be a total flop for me. Don't get me wrong, there are goods and bads to every game, but it seems like this title was more of a disappointment than it was a raving success. I'm not sure of the root cause here either. Like I said, this game had everything going for it, yet it feels like Gearbox forgot to tie their shoelaces before running a marathon and tripped at every mile marker along the way. When they hit their stride, they're unstoppable, delivering compelling characters, thoughtful inclusions to previous entries, and amazing gunplay. But when they fall, they really grind their face into the pavement. Spectacle scenes dropping frames to the single digits, game crashes, bosses glitching out, loot and key items spawning out of bounds, terrible writing, and a slew of other issues that we will cover over the course of this video. So was it a rush development? Maybe a lack of funding? Did Gearbox shoot for the moon and get too big for their britches? Or maybe it was a simple lack of playtesting? Did they hire writers with more red hair dye than writing talent? It's hard to tell and could be a combination of all of these things. Whatever the cause, I'm here to dissect the good and bad of Borderlands 3. So far, I've sunk 40 hours into the game. I've beaten the main story twice and have completed a slew of side missions and optional bosses that the boys and I have stumbled upon. I feel that this is probably 40 times the amount of playtime that many other game journalists, if you can even call them that, have put into the game, which is why I feel like my voice deserves to be heard here. Not to mention that I'm a big fan of the series and played every major entry in the series to completion except for Tales and the final DLC pack that was added to Borderlands 2 shortly before Borderlands 3 was released. Some of these sections will be short, I may meddle on for a few sentences and then move on to something else. I will be sure to put in some on-screen reminders if you want to skip around, along with some general tags in the description. I'd also like to state the obvious by saying that this is a long video and I understand many people won't be able to watch it in one sitting. Feel free to skip around to the sections you want to hear, but some of it may not make sense without the context of the rest of the video. If you plan to sit down and watch the whole thing, then I commend you, thank you, and wish you luck on our adventure. Lastly, beware of spoilers throughout. If you want to experience Borderlands 3 completely blind, then I'd suggest coming back after you've played through the main story. I keep most of the side missions, echo logs, and secrets out of this video so you don't have to 100% the game before continuing on here. We're going to start with the good, then the bad, and end with the average. I hope you enjoy. Well, there goes the grapple grabber, the jet pack, and all the left hand Starting off the good, we're going to cover an obvious one first. The art style of Borderlands is incredibly unique, and is one of the major selling points for me. Cell shading is not only easy on the eyes, but with the color choices and texture designs, you can still build beautiful, stylized atmospheres and very unique characters. Between BL2 and BL3, it feels like the art design got an overhaul. Characters look better than they ever have, Brick looks like he lost some weight, Ellie looks like she's lost some height, and Moxie is as busty as ever. This goes for the environment too. Borderlands 3 takes you through a wide variety of atmospheres and planets that all feel unique. 
The hues of the environments make them interesting, like Eden 6 that has a musky green tint to it. I have mad respect for the art direction in this game. 10 out of 10. Say what you will about the interaction within this game, but you can't deny how much content there is. There are 23 chapters of main story content, and each chapter contains tons of side quests. I wanted to start true Vault Hunter mode before I began doing side missions, but by the end of my first run I had still accidentally accumulated a laundry list of optional content. This game will keep me busy for quite a while, despite the major interactions being going somewhere, shooting something, pressing X, and then fast traveling back. I want to experience everything that Borderlands 3 has to offer, mainly because that gameplay loop is enough to keep me interested in it for an hour or so at a time. Gunplay, gore, weapon farming, build creation, and characters that are genuine and not politically driven is what I am here for. I hope that there's plenty of it, especially that last point, given how divisive and exclusive the main story is. And so far, so good. They even were thoughtful enough to give us a handful of side missions involving Tina, Brick, and Mordecai as they set up a new base of operations on Pandora. There's a lot to experience in Borderlands 3, and I feel as though I'm still nowhere close to 100% despite spending 40 hours in-game thus far. If you create your build correctly and spec into just one or two skill trees for your character, you will legitimately feel more powerful as you traverse through the game. Even just green rarity weapons will sometimes be devastating to certain enemy types thanks to how complementary your skills work with those weapons. I found a green sniper at one point that carried me through five chapters and seven levels thanks to its critical hit multiplier. And like most of the internet, I made a flat critical build that was able to two-shot most grunt level enemies if I landed headshots. One eight round magazine would down most brutes, and then I would whip out the big guns for the bosses. It was great. There are also a wide variety of builds that you can choose from. There are four main characters in the game, and each of the characters have three skill trees you can spec into. You can unlock perks based upon how many skill points you have dedicated into each skill tree, and each character also has three abilities to choose from that can be activated and then have a cooldown time. They all have their pros and cons, some being more viable than others, but the fact that there is so much diversity in the customization is commendable. Also, after you complete the game, you unlock Guardian Tokens, which are like badass rank from Borderlands 2. You get incremental stat bonuses to categories like weapon damage, critical damage, max health, max shield capacity, and rare loot drop chance. So far I am Guardian rank 80 and can easily handle myself in Mayhem 3 on true Vault Hunter mode. Once you reach this point in the game, you really begin to feel the power of the Vault Hunters. All the guns feel great. I have some issues with some of the legendaries being practically useless and other guns that have to charge up before they can fire, but there's a good mix of hit scan and projectile weapons that keep the Borderlands cycle of holding the right trigger interesting. You'll use a lot of different weapons throughout your playthroughs, and the quirks of the gun itself, plus whatever manufacturer made it, keeps the cycle fresh, interesting, and bearable. There are only a couple of points where I got tired of mowing down waves upon waves of enemies, but those were mainly due to the boredom setting in due to the missions being follow this person quests or escort missions. We will touch on the different shooting galleries later in the map design portion, but most of them are designed well enough to suit any playstyle. I like snipers and shotguns, and there are plenty of open killing floors along with tight corridors to paint with raider blood. This section really doesn't need that much explanation. This game is chock full of references and little lines of dialogue that reference earlier games in the series and other Gearbox games. If you keep your ear to the ground, you'll pick up on a lot of these references, which gives satisfying aha moments to fans of the series. Plus, the echo logs you find and certain named enemies all help tie everything together into one cohesive narrative. You can learn more about Handsome Jack's backstory, the relationship with Krieg the Psycho and Maya, and much more. There's a tasteful amount of fan service, and I really appreciate that Gearbox cares about their fans enough to include stuff like this. Say what you want about fan service, but I found this to be tasteful and not overbearing. There are hundreds of easter eggs and references jammed into Borderlands 3. Here's a quick list of some notable ones that I encountered throughout my playthrough. 
Reese will remember that is displayed after you tell him you like or dislike his mustache. This is a call to Tales from the Borderlands and Telltale games in general. It's also funny because if you return in true Vault Hunter mode or New Game Plus, Reese will either have or not have his mustache based upon your choice. A Crimson Raider can be seen with Super Saiyan blue hair and a bandana, obviously referencing Ninja. There's a legendary Hellwalker shotgun that is incredibly strong, shoots heavy metal, and is designed like the double barrel from Doom. Spongebob is referenced in a gun called the Krakatawa. The flavor text reads, get him angry and he's bound to erupt. On some of the computer screens in Sanctuary, there's a game displayed called Borderlands 3, which is a snowboarding game. Claptrap is on a snowboard and there are some funny level names to read as well. Flack references The Hunt, and some of his optional dialogue seems to reference other games that emphasize The Hunt, like Bloodborne and Monster Hunter. When attempting to start a duel with a fellow player, Flack will sometimes reference his Whetstone, which is an item used in Monster Hunter to sharpen your weapon. And lastly, there are some books scattered on the ground, and one of the books titled is Fifty Shades of Gravy, which is a personal favorite of mine. This list could go on and on, but like I said, these are the ones that I encountered without looking up anything and discovering them myself. This is where the good stops. I did not find much of this game to be enjoyable outside of the gameplay loop that I touched on prior. There is nothing deep going on with Borderlands 3 when it comes to the story. Characters don't grow or change in reasonable ways, and the only defining feature of these characters are their gender or sexual preference. On top of that, Borderlands 3 rivals Fallout 76 and the number of bugs and oddities encountered throughout the experience. It got to the point where my friends and I were jokingly saying Bethesda's bug whenever we encountered something that didn't quite make sense. Let's take a look at some of this hogwash in the bad. Oh man, crap, this game is barely playable. This game is barely playable. Barely playable. Starting off the bad, we have the frame rate. Borderlands 3 cannot handle a lot of what it tries to pull off. There have been hundreds of instances where it has felt like I was playing Borderlands 3 on a Samsung smart fridge rather than an Xbox One X. My frames drop to the single digits in the following ways. Too many enemies being on screen. The entire duration of other players joining my game. Bosses that spawn particle effects such as fire, plasma, etc. At one point you open a panel and a bunch of locusts pop out. This outright crashed my game on my first playthrough and dropped my frames on my second playthrough. Large scale spectacle. Specifically, there's an instance where you fire a Death Star-esque laser and each time I've encountered this it has dropped my frames to single digits. Even if you aren't watching the laser go off, the game still stutters worse than Jimmy from South Park. And many bosses also cause my game to lag due to a combination of their attacks and the number of minions that are all jammed into the same arena. There are few games of this generation that are so unpolished that they outright crash, and it is incredibly sad to say that Borderlands 3 is one of them. My game crashed over 10 times throughout my two story playthroughs, and god bless my co-op partner that was playing on a plain Jane Xbox One because his crash number nearly tripled mine. Simple things crash my game. Shooting at enemies, sliding down stairs, picking up weapons, opening my menu to level up, entering or exiting a vehicle, and respawning, all cause my game to freeze up and fill my ears with the sounds of jackhammers before hard quitting and sending me back to the Xbox home screen. This is undeniably unacceptable. Simply playtesting the game at multiple stages of development would solve this issue. A dev would slide down some stairs and the game would crash. They would add that to a list of things that needed more polish and development time. This kind of thing screams underfunding, as if Gearbox couldn't afford to pay their intern $8 an hour to play through the game real quick and take note of the bugs and crashes they encountered so they could fix them pre-launch. Either they didn't play test, or they hired someone that lied on their resume and had never held a controller in their life. This also happens to be the problem with modern day game reviewers for major game publications. It's sad really, these people work in the video game industry or as an arm of the game industry and don't even use the products that they talk about. It just seems stupid, like they don't even try to get good at a game before giving it a fair shake. It's like working on the marketing team for Dove Shampoo and not washing your hair. I could go on, but that's a different rant for a different video. 
This is an important lesson to learn for developers everywhere. You need to be careful with linearity and complexity in level design. Too much linearity and players will begin to get bored and skip to the finish. Too much complexity and players will get lost and frustrated as they fail to navigate the world that you built for them. Borderlands 3 has poor map design. There is far too much verticality. They built these many leveled areas, then built symmetrical arenas to fight minions in. But only the staircase on the left leads to progression. The stairway on the right leads to nothing. There's a level where you're on a massive vehicle and are working to climb your way to the top. This is probably the best example of too much complexity and verticality. As you climb, there are many branching paths, scaffoldings, and climbable boxes that do not lead anywhere and have no connection to the main path. If you're not good at navigating these types of areas, or didn't play Sly Cooper or Mirror's Edge as a kid, you're going to spend a lot of time getting lost and frustrated here. It also doesn't help that enemies will infinitely spawn even if you clear them out. You'll clear out a room, leave the room thinking you're on the right track, find a gun crate with garbage in it, and then once you re-enter the room to try a different path, more enemies will spawn. On top of all of this comes the linearity of room design. Remember how I just mentioned the left staircase versus the right staircase? That is literally littered throughout this level. One path is the right one, and the other leads you to a room full of ammo, an audio log, or a gun crate. I'm all for exploration, but if I'm constantly getting shot, killed, and charged for respawning while I'm trying to figure out the right way to go, I'm gonna get really sick of finding dead ends. There are plenty of good examples of decent map design in Borderlands, but they are always very linear and flat. The minimap can't fuck you over if it's only one floor, so it's always obvious where you're supposed to go, and where there's potential for loot and secrets. The thing with this linearity, though, is that it is boring to navigate. If everything is just running in a straight line, then I just yawn and run past everything. I feel much more compelled to clear out an area room by room if I'm in an unfamiliar area with a good mix of complexity and linearity. A good example of this mix is the Jacob's Mansion that you explore later in the game. It is a massive mansion with branching rooms and differing areas. Clearing this out was a treat. Enemies didn't constantly respawn, so my friends and I were able to explore every room of this giant house and find all of the secrets, audio logs, optional missions, and gun crates. Unfortunately, very few areas strike the balance of complexity and linearity, and even if they do, there's a chance that it's a one-off story-related area and you will have no reason to ever return. Finding a mix of complexity and linearity is the key to good level design. Borderlands 3 maps, unfortunately, are either far too complex or far too linear, with very few areas reaching a happy medium of the two. I will commend them for the scale and size of the overworlds, though. The sheer scale of this game is impressive and deserves praise just for that. There are a handful of overworlds where you can drive around and explore, but there are also mission-related set pieces and branching areas that are all connected to the same overworld. In that regard, the map design is nice. When you boil it down to the nitty gritty, it's either running in a straight line or trying to navigate a hall of mirrors. And the mini map doesn't do you any favors either. The layer design of the mini map is terrible, and the fact that there is just one diamond marker that appears on your screen directing you where to go is not only outdated, but frequently will misdirect the player into exploring areas that end up not being their current objective. I remember my friends and I found the same Carnage Tyrant mini-boss like three times since we thought that we were following the mini-map only to find that we needed to go down a different path that looped behind the Carnage Tyrant mini-boss area. It looked as though we were headed straight to the marker, but nope, just the same big dinosaur. It was only when we didn't let the diamond guide us and we split up to go down many branching paths that we finally found our objective. This feature is frustrating to say the least. Not only that, but navigating the map in the menus is even more clunky and confusing. It feels like you're rotating the entire map based around the center of your screen, rather than being able to move the center of your screen around a stationary map to your location of choice. It reminds me of the Dead Space map, but more confusing. The whole map is designed with ups and downs built in, but when viewing the map from a bird's eye, which is the default view, it all looks like it's stacked on top of each other. Plus, it's zoomed in unnaturally far, so you have to pan all the way out, then zoom back in so you can differentiate between the layers of maps stacked on top of one another. Monster Hunter World and Dead Rising do it right by giving the players a floor-by-floor -floor view of wherever they are exploring. 
If you're on the third floor, the map would only show you the third floor, but you could hit a button and cycle to only viewing the second or first floor. Monster Hunter and Dead Rising also do the players plenty of favors when it comes to navigation by giving them scout flies and arrow markers to help them navigate through the complex levels. I compel all of you to pick up Monster Hunter World and attempt to navigate and memorize the ancient forest without the help of the map or scout flies. It will suck big time, and that is exactly how it feels to navigate the worlds of Borderlands 3. You explore a lot of branching areas just to be disappointed because you're not really at your objective. Hell, you might not even be on the same plane as your objective, and that diamond doesn't do a damn thing to help you. A friend of mine thought that adding a dotted line on the minimap would help guide the players to their destinations, and I agree. However, I feel like many players would avoid exploration altogether in favor of brainlessly following the dotted line. Exploration is still a large part of Borderlands, partly due to the loot and partly due to the amount of secrets and references that can be discovered. I much prefer the arrow that guides you in Dead Rising, since it is more accurate than the diamond but doesn't directly show you the way to the OBJ. If you walked into a room and the arrow pointed up, you could walk up the stairs and find the right way to go. Or you could climb up those suspicious stack of crates and find a gun cache. Combining navigation with exploration would make this game much more appealing, especially in the more complex and vertically focused levels. Many of the main bosses in this game feel like I'm playing a bullet hell game like Cuphead, which would be fine if the characters didn't feel like you were piloting a refrigerator. Bosses' moves don't have clear tells, and I found myself dying constantly due to lack of movement speed or jump height that would be required to dodge these bullet hell AoEs. The Troy and Tyrene fights are notorious for this type of combat. Troy will stand in the middle of the arena and shoot giant orbs in a full 360 that you either have to squeeze between or jump over. Except that you can't get enough jump height unless you're standing in the middle of the arena with him, which is a large triangle that gives you more jump height for some reason. But if you're right next to him, you'll just get hit before you have time to react. Tyrene has a move like a double dutch jump rope, but Flack is so fucking tall that it feels like there's no way for you to dodge this attack without clipping your head on the next laser in line. Are you supposed to get hit here? Is this a damage check to make sure that you're the right level or have good gear or something? It just doesn't make sense to include seemingly undodgeable attacks. And it's not like the game expects you to not go down and enter fight for your life, because in many boss arenas they included minions with minuscule health pools so you can catch a second wind and be back in the fight. The whole design just seems poor. If you're gonna send projectiles at me that are literally the size of my character, you could at least give me some cover to hide behind. These open arena fights just feel like tactically eating undodgeable attacks while constantly strafing around the boss to dodge the hit scan attacks while waiting for your shields to regen and begging for the smaller mobs to not interrupt that recharge process. I hate to throw out the term artificial difficulty because that seems to trigger people that don't understand what other people mean by that, but it really feels like artificial damage to raise tension in an otherwise boring fight. The fights I did enjoy were versus purely hitscan bosses, or bosses that had a mix of hitscan and area of effect attacks. The second boss of the game, Megaphone or whatever his name is, had AoEs with reasonable charge up and tells, so you could see where you needed to be in order to not get hit. The game even teaches the player about these attacks because he has traps set up in the same style as his attacks. If a line of speakers begin to charge and change from blue to red, get away from them. Another good example is the Penn and Teller boss fight that lights up the floor where the AoE is about to hit. This is smart, and so much better than the lazy boss design that you encounter later on. Here's a line of giant plasma balls and rotating lasers! Good luck! A hard lock is when your game crashes. A soft lock is when you can continue to interact with the world around you but are unable to progress further through the game. During my time with Borderlands 3, I experienced both types of locks, soft locks being more frustrating in my opinion since you could wander around for 30 minutes before realizing that brick isn't moving and needs to open a door, or that a vault key fragment spawned out of bounds because you killed a boss while it was close to a ceiling. My favorite soft lock was when a required quest item decided fuck gravity and floated up to the ceiling, where we couldn't reach it. After quitting and reloading, it plopped down in the middle of the floor and we were able to progress. 
During a side quest, a turret is supposed to destroy a wooden pallet blocking an interactable object, but it didn't. I spent 15 minutes wandering around the room itself and the cave surrounding it before assuming that the quest had bugged out. I reloaded the game and sure enough, the pallet wasn't there and I was able to complete the quest. However, my best example is getting spawned in after a cutscene following one of the last bosses. I was locked in place, unable to move, without a gun, and unable to navigate any of the menus. My co-op partner managed to navigate us back to Sanctuary and it made the lock worse. I didn't have any HUD and was just completely locked in place. These types of bugs, glitches, and locks are absolutely unacceptable for a full-price, triple-A, player-versus-enemy game that has been in development since 2015. Considering that Gearbox already had models for many of the characters, assets, textures, interactables, etc., I am shocked that a game with this large of a following and this much money was released in such a broken and unfinished state. It really leads me back to the opening question of this video. Gearbox, what the hell happened here? To put it simply, Borderlands 3 has way too much padding. There are hundreds of instances where you're just waiting for an NPC to interact with something, waiting for an NPC to catch up with you, waiting for a conversation to finish, or waiting for characters to dump exposition into your lap. I write my scripts before I edit my videos, but the gameplay that you're watching now is strictly the content of the game. I've cut out all of the loading, fast traveling, waiting for conversations, etc. After you've cut all of this out, you begin to see how bare bones, boring, and short this game is. You spend so much time being told things rather than shown them, and spend countless hours waiting around to be told where to go next. Not to mention that after just about every main quest, you have to return to Sanctuary and navigate the needlessly complicated ship to deliver vault keys to Tannis. This just eats up more of your precious time, and I found myself constantly staring at the time ticking up on OBS, wondering how long I've spent actually playing the game versus how much time I've spent experiencing blatant filler to support a bloated runtime. Why do games in the current age demand to boast how long their games are? I would much rather spend $60 on a compelling 4 hour story with good character development, character arts, and interaction with the world around it, rather than spend $60 on a game that boasts a 40 hour story with 36 hours of padding. Just cut the bullshit and make a game. On a real note, game developers and the businesses behind them don't understand how precious a gamer's time is. We work 40 hours a week and are still expected to have hobbies outside of games, upkeep a social life, relationships, family life, etc. Too many games out there beg for you to log in daily or weekly in order to complete quests and do challenges that progress you through a season pass or other strategy to keep you playing their game instead of a competitor's games. Why, did, why not just make better games that warrant me to return to? Monster Hunter World has a daily login bonus and weekly quests, but these do not unlock tiers in a season pass, give you new skins, or let you open more loot boxes so you have a chance of playing on an equal playing field with those lucky ducks that pulled that bullshit overpowered weapon after spending $300 on slot machines. They reward the player for returning to the game, but in a way that does not negatively impact the longevity of the game. I'm not going to play a game that I hate for hours a day just to unlock a weapon, card, etc. at the end of a season pass, or to do daily quests for more weapon skins. Again, there's a longer argument to be made on that topic, but today's focus is Borderlands 3. We're now going to cover the main story. Borderlands 3 focuses on the same things from Borderlands 2 that made it successful, but does not build on any of it, leaving us with a stagnant and barely serviceable main story. And before we go any further, I am not only going to spoil, but also rail this story into the dirt. The too long didn't read of this introduction is, I play games to escape reality, and to be told a compelling story with actual characters, not planks of wood that demand respect just because of their sexual orientation or because they have an Arby's roast beef sandwich dangling between their legs. You all may find this unnecessary. Many people that play Borderlands are more interested in the looting and shooting rather than the story, but the fact that so much rides on the story and that you are forced to experience it in order to progress is enough justification for me to tear it limb from limb. 
The developers found the story so profound, so progressive and groundbreaking that they made all the cutscenes unskippable, so even if you don't buy into their message or don't care about the story, you still have to waste hours of your life watching it. It would be one thing if your story was good and you had unskippable cutscenes, but this belligerent pandering within the Borderlands universe is such an abortion that I would be doing myself and my audience a disservice by just brushing it under the rug. Lastly, if you want to experience everything the game has to offer, such as traveling to different planets, getting more weapon slots, unlocking artifact slots, breaking opium iridium caches, or meeting up with characters from older games, you have to progress in the storyline. You start off with Marcus telling a bedtime story again, and then he drives you on a bus to the start of the game. You meet Lilith and Claptrap, both of which vomit exposition in your lap with intermittent psycho-killing so you don't get bored. From there, you get a car from Ellie, are introduced to the shitty driving mechanics, and are thrust into this galaxy-wide fetch quest of which you as a vault hunter have no stake in. You're here for the vaults, yes, and the Crimson Raiders are also interested in the vaults. But imagine if the Calypso twins hijacked the bus from Marcus, recruited you into the COV, and told you that they were also on the hunt for vaults. You would join their side, since that is your only goal. The only reason why you don't join them is because of plot convenience. Remember the beginning of Borderlands 2? You open on a train with your fellow vault hunters, only for Handsome Jack to ambush you, blow up the train, nearly kill you, and leave you for dead on the icy tundra of the southern shelf of Pandora. From there, you immediately have a stake in the game, despite not knowing any of his other intentions. He just tried to kill you, it's time to power up and get revenge. From there, you meet the Crimson Raiders, who have the same mission as you for differing reasons. See how this is infinitely times better than just getting off a bus and having exposition vomited into your lap? You have a stake in the game before it even starts. Jack tried to kill you, and that's enough for most people to not like Jack enough to do whatever it takes to track him down and kill his ass instead. In Borderlands 3, you have no stake in the story, and take a backseat role, which makes no sense. Vault Hunters are as powerful, and sometimes more powerful, than Sirens. I mean, for Christ's sake, you kill the all-powerful God Sirens, Troy and Tyrene, while they have the combined powers of Lilith, Maya, and each other. Not to mention that the Vault Hunters are the only things that drive the story along. Lilith has no powers and is useless. Maya is killed about as soon as she is reintroduced. Ava is a child, and Tana just ex machina's having siren powers when the story feels the need to have a big reveal. Despite the only force that moves the story forward, you do not have a place within the story itself. If you were absent, like the game wants you to believe that you are, then the Calypso Twins would have succeeded in their mission and become the most powerful beings in the universe. You cannot convince me that the band of misfits known as the Crimson Raiders in this game would have any chance against the COV without their vault hunting companions. So after a poop tier beginning, you work on getting off of Pandora. The Calypso twins intercept your plans and you learn about their siren powers. Tyrene can siphon powers from other sirens, and Troy, a male, has siren powers as well. This is a big deal in the Borderlands universe, since only females can be sirens. Tyrene and Troy then explained that they were conjoined twins, and Troy was cut off of Tyrene at birth, thus giving him his powers and explaining his missing arm. Imagine if the players were given this mystery to ponder throughout the game. It could even be a big deal as we begin to wonder if Tyrene can make people a siren. Or better yet, knowing how much this game likes politics, Troy could have been born a woman but decided to become a man later in his life. Instead, this big mystery is immediately revealed and explicitly stated by Tyrene. Lilith gets her power sapped again, and you leave Pandora. Good writing out of 10, and by that I mean your writing team is garbage. I will give it to Gearbox. This is one of the few scenes where you are actually separated from the cutscene in a way that makes sense. A door closes so you cannot intercept the Calypso twins. There are plenty of other instances throughout the game where you are simply absent. The best example of this is after you come out of the first vault. You are canonically standing about 15 feet away from where the cutscene is taking place, but the game just pretends that you don't exist. Probably because one good bullet would cut this garbage game short. You could intervene in the squabble between Maya, Ava, Tyrene, and Troy, and kill the Calypso twins right there. They aren't even that powerful at that point, because Troy hadn't absorbed Maya's powers yet. Boom. Roll credits. The game is over. But no, the game pretends you don't exist. 
This plot convenience continues throughout the game. You kill a massive raid boss, only for the real main characters to come in and take all the glory. It's just so contrived and a perfect example of shit writing. The only thing stopping the player from killing the twins on many occasions is simply because the game doesn't want you to kill them yet and pretends you don't exist. From here you go on a galaxy-wide fetch quest as you attempt to build and charge vault keys in order to stay one step ahead of the Calypso twins. You make some allies along the way, mainly by inserting yourself into their conflicts and doing fetch quests for them that turn the tides in their favor. You practically get beat off by side characters who use the power of the vault hunters to do their bidding for a while. Reese from Tales of the Borderlands takes you for a spin as he attempts to win a losing battle against another corporate CEO that has the hots for him. You do a handful of missions for him before he finally forks up the vault key and eventually gives you the location of a vault. Another example is later on on Eden 6. You meet the CEO of the Jacobs Company. He sits in his mansion bitching about his daddy issues while you go on fetch quests for him before you finally get to advance the story. There are very few main missions that stand out as unique and interesting. You destroy a super vehicle with a Penn and Teller cameo and a literal spectacle boss. You do a jailbreak and meet the cast of previous games and explore a handful of vaults. That's about it. So basically you jump from planet to planet doing fuck all until the game decides it's time to tie everything together. You kill Troy after he attempts to sap the life and power from Tyrene in order to charge Pandora's moon, and for some reason that I am still scratching my head at, Ava absorbs Troy's powers and becomes a siren. That's right, apparently every siren has this absorption power, or when a siren dies, any old schmuck can go up, touch the body, and become a siren themselves. It doesn't make any fucking sense, and then the game has the audacity to do it again after you kill Tyrene at the end, but I'm getting ahead of myself. You go to a planet that isn't supposed to exist, and it is not only home to the first vault, but also the first vault hunter. Throughout the game, you can discover audio logs that were recorded and deposited by Typhon de Leon, the first vault hunter that was tasked with finding and opening vaults by the major corporations that funded him. Eventually, he betrayed these massive corporations, found a lovely lady, and they went to Missing Planet Ex Machina and opened the first vault together. They killed the Guardian inside, had some crazy Vault Hunter sex, and spit out a couple of kids. Typhon de Leon is a shining star of a character in this game, and it's a shame that he doesn't survive past the three main missions that he is included in. Whoever wrote his dialogue specifically deserves a gold star, because he reveals information in a way that isn't contrived or forced. He even justifies his exposition dump by saying that his only companions in recent history are his two robot butlers, and that it's nice to be able to interact with real people. Tannis makes it clear that she is love-struck with Typhon, and asks at one point if there is a Mrs. De Leon. He explains that she died, and then goes on to reveal that the Calypso twins were his kids, and that Tyrene killed her own mother for being too overprotective. He recognizes that his kids are evil, and that it is his responsibility to help finish what you have started. So he accompanies you on activating a failsafe that will prevent Pandora from being ripped apart, and seal the ancient evil that lurks inside, so that Tyrene won't be able to sap its powers and become the queen of the universe. <laughs> When he comes face to face with his own daughter, he attempts to kill himself and her with a grenade. He detonates it, and Tyrene manages to absorb the grenade blast exactly like a scene from X-Men First Class, and then directs the blast at her own father, killing him. You travel back to Pandora that is being torn apart thanks to the power of the moon being siphoned into the planet and opening a massive vault. Tyrene gives herself up to the Guardian and fuses with it, becoming a grossly disfigured monster that you then slay. Both twins are dead, but the vault has been opened and Pandora is still being torn apart. I guess that the moon was still being sucked into the planet and thus destroying Pandora, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But I guess if that magical suck was closed, then Lilith wouldn't be able to make this big sacrifice in order to stop it and save Pandora like the queen bee that she is. This is despite the fact that the only time she actually saved Pandora was in the first game. In both the second and third game, Vault Hunters saved the planet, with Lilith standing on the sideline like a glorified cheerleader and taking all of the credit. 
Regardless, the power of the Vault Monster and Tyrene power up Lilith enough for her to become a Super Siren. She flies into orbit, cutting off the power flow of the moon, and painting a massive Firehawk symbol on it. This apparently kills her, despite it not being fully explained how or why this is what needed to be done. The game ends with Girl on Fire by Alicia Keys, and the credits roll. What a load of shit. I originally had the story being just average, but after playing through it a second time and actually taking notes, I wish I could power wash my brain and scrub it clean of this entire experience. At no point is the writing ever above average, and barely any of the story beats make any sense. I guess Gearbox expects all the players to just accept these coincidences and run at the blue diamond mission marker like a bunch of default skins, and to cheer whenever there's a minority or woman on screen. I did not enjoy this experience whatsoever, and I'm going to let this story be a lesson to me about why I shouldn't expect these large studios to tell a good story besides Rockstar. Shout out to Dan for being a bloody legend. Grab a fucking stubby, mate. You're a damn legend. Shalloin, bring these Ripper legends some stubbies and a pack of menthols. Sick. From the get-go, I think that Troy and Tyrion are weak villains. They're incredibly default besides a somewhat decent backstory that is only made decent by a character introduced 90% of the way through the game. Otherwise, they just seem like power-hungry psychopaths that are hell-bent on becoming gods and live-streaming it all. Speaking of which, that whole streamer leet speed gimmick that they have going on is cringy as shit. The absolute last thing that I want to hear from a video game villain is them telling me to subscribe to their fucking Twitch channel. And it's not like it's a one-time thing either. They keep that stupid shit going throughout the entire game. On top of a stupid gimmick, they had huge shoes to fill after Handsome Jack took the video game world by storm. Many people, including me, revere him as one of the best of game villains to be written, and after five years of planning, you came up with this? They don't have this deep-seated hatred for bandits and a lust for peace through tyranny like Handsome Jack. They also don't have a compelling reason to even be villains. They weren't allowed to leave the planet they were born on, and that made Tyrene so mad that she killed her own mom and then tried to use her siphoning siren powers to take over the universe. That's it. I summed it up in one sentence. Oh, and Troy is a male siren because he was conjoined with Tyrene at birth and they had to cut him off of her. That's why he only has one arm, and why Tyrene calls Troy a leech all throughout the game. You may think that that is supposed to be a major spoiler, but Tyrene literally spells it out for the player 20 minutes into the game. No mystery, no pondering, she literally explicitly states the reason that Troy is a male siren. Troy even learns through the course of the game that he has the same siphoning powers as Tyrene, and the game teases you with a power shift but then does nothing with it. Right when it seems like the two siblings are going to have a fight for power, Troy just deadass starts draining Tyrene's power off screen and you're forced to intervene. Why didn't Tyrene put up a fight? How did Troy manage to overpower her? Why didn't the player get to see any of this? Shitty writing, that's why. You simply have to accept that Troy went as power hungry as Tyrene and betrayed her. This would be a simple fix, too. Just make it so that there is some dialogue between Tyrene and Troy, maybe some scuffling and sibling rivalry as they attempt to one-up each other with their powers. Maybe Troy phase-locks Tyrene for an extended amount of time, and she disappears from a portion of the story, only for you to find out that Troy has had her locked up and has been siphoning her power along with the power of Iridium in order to open up the massive vault on Pandora. That's better writing, and that came off the top of my head. I'm writing this at 3am in a basement closet with no formal writing training whatsoever. Just a nose for bullshit. And she's gone. Oh, man. Practical nuke incoming! It pains me that I have to write a section like this. It really does, because I, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it, but it just it's screaming in my face. It really goes without saying, but no game should have forced political messages. 
but Borderlands 3 really starts to hit you upside the head with these messages about halfway through the game. I thought it was a little strange that your player character didn't appear in any cutscenes, and by the end of the game it was very apparent the message that Gearbox was attempting to portray. Women are strong, women are fighters, women can be badasses too. But we know this already. Laura Croft from Tomb Raider has been a badass female protagonist since the early 1990s. She is an incredibly talented, successful, and intelligent explorer that has dealt with dinosaurs, the paranormal, and twisted businessmen. Faith Connors is a kung fu and parkour master in Mirror's Edge that works to uncover a mystery surrounding her family ties in a world that is dominated by surveillance. Ellie from The Last of Us is a compelling young girl that experiences character growth and literally growing up in an apocalyptic world, learning life lessons like dealing with tragedy, who you can trust, and the blurred lines between right and wrong. Sadie Adler learns to live an independent life after she is abused and her husband is killed in Red Dead 2. She successfully seeks revenge on those that wronged her, eventually becoming one of the most badass gunslingers in the West and a fearsome bounty hunter. Meanwhile, Lilith, Maya, Maya, Ava, and Tannis are just women with no real discernible character traits that are built on. There is no growth for these characters at all, and if you didn't play any of the other Borderlands games, you will not understand their quirks, question how they are the last hope for humanity, and worst of all, you just won't care. This is especially terrible, because this trend of inclusivity for the sake of inclusivity has plagued just about every game to be released in the past two years, and I'm sick of it. There's a reason why Red Dead 2 was able to invoke a wide range of emotions out of me, and why games like Battlefield 5, Wolfenstein New Blood, and Borderlands 3 made me want to dump bleach into my eye sockets. One game has diversity without shouting about how inclusive they are, and the other shoves political messages down your throat. And look, it's one thing to be inclusive, and to make characters that have diverse backgrounds, ethnicities, sexual orientations, and genders. That's totally fine. I am all for that. But it is completely different to jam those messages down our throats. The only important characters in the story are women. There is a massive, galaxy-wide threat, yet three women and a young girl get the entire spotlight. The player characters aren't even important. Throughout the game, you are downgraded from Vault Hunter to Vault Thief to just Killer. You do all of the heavy lifting, regardless of what character you are, yet only Tannis, Maya, Ava, and Lilith are focused on and shown off in any story-related cutscenes. You do all the heavy lifting, killing drones of enemies, downing massive vault protectors that rival the titans from ancient Greek mythology, and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with infinitely powerful sirens that could phase lock your brain and turn it into liquids, just for these three bitches that haven't done anything to come in afterwards and take all the credit. What's even funnier is that none of them even commend you on your amazing feats. Balex, the ship's navigation computer and voice of sanctuary, is the only one to thank you and commend you for killing the Calypso twins, putting an end to their quest for universe domination. Meanwhile, every other main character is dead set focused on Lilith for sacrificing herself and painting a bird on Pandora's moon. Like, really? Not only was that the only thing that she did during the entire game, but her sacrifice made zero sense. So was this script written during the heat of the 2016 election? Did that one bitch with red hair and resting fish face sneak into Gearbox and take a shit on their lead writer's keyboard? Because that's what it feels like. After all that, you might be thinking, but dads, Hammerlock and Jacobs were front and center during their portion of the game. And you're right, but they're gay. So basically, if you're straight or male, you can go fuck yourself to the back of the line. There are only a handful of male characters in the game to begin with, and all of the new ones are complete pushovers. Vaughn is a delusional war chief that literally runs around in soiled underwear wearing a cape. Reese is a pussy boy that cries about his favorite frozen yogurt shop getting destroyed. Katagawa is a stereotypical rich suit and has the hots for Reese, because he sure seems to be more interested in a partnership with him than just killing him and taking over his company. Other characters even call Katagawa obsessed with Reese. Troy Calypso plays second fiddle to Tyrene the entire game, and is constantly insulted by her throughout. He gets 10 minutes in the spotlight and has the chance to become a character, then you kill him. 
Brick and Mordecai return for one mission and one side mission each. Hammerlock and Jacobs are literally gay, and the other male characters are side characters at best, such as Clay and Balex, who are introduced and then just as quickly get shoved in the background in favor of big reveals about Tannis, Ava, Maya, and Lilith. It's just so obvious, shoehorned, and pointless. It's not that I don't want these types of characters to get in the spotlight, but everyone should be in the spotlight. When you are including certain groups and excluding others, that's showing blatant favoritism for that group and pandering to them. Not only that, but stapling women can be badasses too on all of your marketing material and plastering that sort of message all throughout the game is not only ignoring your target market, but also catering to an extremely small vocal minority that aren't even going to buy or play your game. Imagine making a game for people that play it. What a novel concept that must be. Oh, and one last thing before I hop off my political soapbox. The song of the ending credits. The last track that you hear after hours and hours of a blood, sweat, and tears tearing through the galaxy is This Girl on Fire by Alicia Keys. Jesus H. Christ, How the Mighty Have Fallen. Many games are plagued with the problem of not really being interactive, despite the medium itself being interactive media, but the word itself is subjective. Yes, you are interacting with this media. Just by playing the game means that you are interacting with it, but when the game can be boiled down to the same few actions, you aren't really interacting, more or less just repeating the same few actions as you make your way through the narrative. Borderlands 3 has some of the least interactive quests in all of gaming. It can all be boiled down to the same few actions. Run to a location, kill stuff at said location, hit X on a certain object, person, etc. That's it. That's the whole list. That is all you do in Borderlands. Half the time your player character has nothing to say in response and just blindly follows the diamond quest markers. Most of the interactions in this game are reading text. You look at abilities and skills to see what meshes well together. You read gun descriptions and try them out. Just looking at the damage number isn't enough. You have to see what multipliers are on the weapon, what manufacturer made it, and what sort of projectile it shoots. You could find a gun that dishes out 10,000 damage a shot, then fire it and realize that the projectiles move at a snail's pace, making it next to impossible to utilize that 10,000 damage. Basically, the more you read and study the equipment you receive in Borderlands, the more powerful you will become. That is what you interact with. Your stats. Otherwise, you just run around, shoot stuff, and hit X on certain things. You don't interact with characters, enemies, or the world around you in a meaningful way. There are no dialogue options or player choice. You don't even have a slick animation for pushing buttons, which I originally made fun of games for including, but now I realize it helps the player feel like they are legitimately interacting with the world around them. Too Long didn't read, all of the side quests and main quest line for that matter are just fetch quests. Sure, the writing for some of these one-off characters is entertaining, like the professor or geologist or whatever who is overprotective of some rocks, which turns out to be petrified monkey poop, or the deep swamp fellow that wants you to kill a witch or the two robots with vastly different personalities that you meet at the end of the game. The characters behind the quests are typically spot on and entertaining, but in between those moments of listening to them gabber on, you are, and keep in mind this list is exhaustive, running to a location, shooting enemies there, hitting X on an object, and fast traveling back. That's right, you don't even have to run back, thanks to the iPod in your pocket that lets you fast travel to practically every point of interest in the game. That's why Borderlands 3 is a compelling game to speedrun, due to the simple nature of the tax tasks you have to do, and the sheer amount of enemies that you can straight up skip in favor of getting to the next objective. On top of the fast traveling tech, and skips that could be discovered, I feel compelled to play more of this game, but fast. However, I would never speedrun this game unless there are some major updates that patch many of the bugs and crashes that are currently plaguing it, along with the option to skip cutscenes. 
As a final note, a way to improve upon the linearity of these quests would be to add more player choice. Even the illusion of choice would be better than nothing. This is even teased in the main story. You're given the option to hold X or Y to make decisions that end up not impacting the main game at all. Side quests do not have to follow a set linear path like the main quest line, so adding two different outcomes of side missions would add player choice and create a more dynamic world to interact with. For example, instead of killing the witch on Eden 6, make it so you can side with her and kill the guy that gave you the quest. Maybe she still betrays you and you have to kill her regardless, but that's just one example of a plethora of decisions that could be made to make these linear quests more interesting. The side quests currently feel more like forced exploration and add little value to the actual game besides wasting time after you're already a god. Player choice is what is really missing from Borderlands 3. Even in Borderlands 2 you had missions that gave you choice. Kill this person or spare them, side with this gang or the other gang. Even simple stuff would be a fine addition, like you get a shield or a gun as a quest reward. Take your pick. This would break up the monotony of running somewhere, killing something, fast traveling back, listening to dialogue, and making some money. The music in Borderlands isn't typically an aspect that most people focus on, but there are a handful of moments that deserve to be touched on. Before that though, I will commend the composer for writing great music during traveling, combat, and otherwise. All of the tracks that do not have lyrics are very fitting, not only for the game it takes place in, but also for the environment where these actions are taking place. Music on Eden 6 has some drawl, some banjos, and a nice swamp feel. Tracks on Necro de Feo feel mysterious and have a tension to them that make you feel as though your actions carry more weight and you're somewhere that you're not supposed to be. There are three moments that make the music average instead of good for me. There are two driving portions during the game. In the first one, you're escorting Maya through COV territory, and the entire time there is a strange, empowering pop track that feels genuinely out of place. It doesn't make it any better that this song is apparently from Ellie's playlist, and this doesn't seem like the type of music that Ellie would get down to. I mean, for Christ's sake, she tortures, then turns a psycho into red mist during her intro cutscene. It is jarring, and doesn't fit the mood that they are attempting to convey. Plus, cars are as weak as the character development in this game, so the music abruptly stops and then starts again as your vehicle gets demolished and you spawn another one. The second instance of poor music design still has me scratching my head, but I have a theory as to why this choice was made. During another driving sequence much later on, you are transporting a battery with Vaughn so that Tannis can get more Ex Machina Siren powers. It is an intense sequence that has the player making jumps, killing enemies, and dodging rockets. It's pretty hardcore. So what kind of music do you think plays here? If you answered anything besides smooth jazz, you're dead wrong. Jazz plays during this pivotal escort section. What is even more off about this choice is that Vaughn says the phrase danger zone multiple times throughout your drive. So here's the theory. Gearbox didn't have enough money to buy the rights to Kenny Lodgen's Danger Zone because they blew the entire music budget to get the rights to Girl on Fire by Alicia Keys for the credits. This seemed like a rushed and last minute decision and is such a disappointment. Dear Gearbox, I wish I had the opportunity to take a dump in your rotating door and do a little spin and smear. Love, Dads. The last instance of garbage music choice is Girl on Fire. You, the Vault Hunter, just saved the universe, not Lilith. You just traveled across the galaxy and were the only beings willing to try and topple their regime of evil villains and halt their plans of galaxy-wide domination. Yet Lilith's sacrifice and girl power is what we really need to focus on as the credits roll. Yeah, you get a right big go fuck yourself for that one, fam. Zero out of ten, I wish I could give negative stars. Only two characters are really viable for single-player runs, and funnily enough, one is a straight white male and the other is a robot that has the personality and voice of a man. So basically, if you play as a female character, you get to be just like all the other females in this game. Completely useless. There are some instances where your map isn't correctly updated. Players that are ahead of the curve could end up entering areas they aren't supposed to, possibly ending in your demise. 
Depending on how much cash you have, you could lose a girthy chunk of change. There is one mission where you attempt to raid the main antagonist's base of operations, and if you get there before some dialogue ends, you get insta-killed by turrets. I had about 100k at the time and lost about 10k, which is a lot for this stage in the game. I wish the game would just tell you that your objective is to wait for character X to shut their mouth, and then update the map accordingly. I experienced another glitch while looting a vault during the main story. I meleeed an iridium chest and fell through the map. This killed me, and this time I lost $111,000. Thanks, Gearbox. There are also some quest markers that just don't show up. On Eden 6, after a couple of missions, it tells you to return to Jacob's, but doesn't put the quest marker on Jacob's, it just doesn't exist. You have to travel there yourself and talk to him without the diamond ever showing up. I won't lie, I'm a real stickler when it comes to dialogue in games. It is difficult to convey certain emotions while still driving the story along without the lines seeming contrived or forced. While some jokes don't land, and some lines seem forced to drive the story along, enough of it lands to keep me involved and paying attention. Some of the humor has evolved since Borderlands 2, and had me laughing with the game, rather than at it. This is a major plus. There's a reason why Marvel movies are so popular. The stories and characters deal with grim and dark themes, but there is humor sprinkled throughout that keeps things light-hearted, despite the harrowing circumstances. Same goes for Borderlands 3. There are two siren maniacs that are trying to absorb the power of vault monsters in order to become the most powerful beings in the universe. They're raising an army of devote followers through their live streams and are willing to kill anyone in their way, including both of their parents, in order to achieve their goals. That's not to say that it's good though, I'm willing to say that it's slightly above average. Some of the tropes chosen to represent the characters are just trash and outdated. It feels like the script for this game was written in late 2015 or early 2016. The whole toxic livestreamer thing that the main antagonists have going on would make lesser men physically ill while trying to sit through it. No one likes streamers or YouTubers like that anymore, unless of course you're 9 years old and don't understand the concept of clickbait yet. Another thing is that all of the characters just seem like dull NPCs. None of the main dialogue has any weight or meaning. When the game attempts to deal with heavy-handed themes, it falls on its face. It is so lackluster and unmemorable that I cannot remember any of the lines besides a handful of comedic ones that were either spoken by side characters or the player characters. Nothing the four women ever said stuck with me after I turned off the game. And in comparison, there are Red Dead 2 quotes that still enter my head, like, Remember, it ain't us that changed. My favorite quote from Borderlands is from Clay, and he says, Freedom ain't free. In fact, it costs more than most things. Another thing that stuck out is Flack, and how his demeanor changes over the course of the game. There are great lines that come from each of the player characters, but Flack really sticks out to me since he is literally a robot that seems to learn how to have a personality. He's stiff and straight to the point during the beginning chapters, but loosens up and learns humor, banter, and other emotions from the other characters throughout the game. And the way his dialogue is written is fantastic. When you first meet Reese, Flack asks if his mustache is used to attract a mate, or is used to scare away predators. And when you meet Balex, he asks if Balex's default physical form is the pink teddy bear, which had me kecking. One last thing. The audio logs are absolutely top-notch. I don't want to spoil anything deep, but just know that Krieg the Psycho, Maya, Handsome Jack, Angel, and more have audio logs scattered throughout the game that help build these character arcs and make them all the more compelling. Hearing Krieg succumb to becoming a psycho, and Maya learning to decipher his seemingly incoherent screaming is gut-wrenching. Their whole story arc made me feel sorry for Krieg, especially after hearing the last audio log between him and Maya especially knowing that Maya promised to return home to Krieg, but now never will. To put it into perspective, Krieg is the second best character in Borderlands 3, and his only appearance is in like five echologues. And in case anyone is wondering, the best written character in BL3 is Typhon de Leon, the first Vault Hunter. The problem with this stems from the fact that many players will never experience this dialogue and will brainlessly follow the objective marker until they get to hit X on something. 
Any sort of exploration for audio logs or seeking out interesting side content seems to be gone by the wayside in favor of being brainless and running from point A to point B with guns a-blazing. Again, I understand that the main draw of this game is loot, leveling up, creating a build, and shooting, but there are some real gems in the audio logs and side content that many players will never experience for themselves. And considering how ham-fisted and trash the main story is, I fully expect many players to put the game down and never pick it up again after they finish it. At least that's happened with my friend group. At the end of this long list of good, bad, and average, we have Claptrap. I wish I could clap Claptrap, and I don't mean clap his dummy thick cheeks. He is still annoying as shit, and every time he opened his gab, I wanted to shove a shotgun in it and blow his electrical parts all over the walls behind him. I just don't see the appeal of his character. He's like a five-year-old, constantly running around and screaming, spewing one-liners that aren't funny, and it's just downright cringy. He only has a handful of lines that I legitimately found funny, or even entertaining, one of which how he used the word thick, and then clarified that it was a thick with two C's. That got a legitimate kick out of me. The rest of his dialogue just sounded like f like a fork on a glass plate or nails on a chalkboard. Claptrap alone makes me glad that every other Claptrap unit is fucking dead. I wish we could just kill the last one and shut his trap for good. The only reason why he is average rather than straight up bad is because he is only seen at the beginning of the story and the end. Otherwise, he sits in a shoebox, quietly, like a good little trash can. In conclusion, Borderlands 3 needs a handful of major updates to make it a worthwhile purchase, and while there are some legitimate complaints circulating around the internet, I feel as though many of these reviewers are just trash at games. I've heard complaints about difficulty and level-related scaling, when in reality these reviewers probably haven't spec their characters correctly and are trying to brute force their way to the end so they can spit out a half-assed review. Or they experience the litany of Bethesda's bugs and are writing these off as poor design and poor balancing. Either way, I don't trust major publishers when it comes to game reviews, especially for Borderlands 3. Many series' favorite characters are brought back and reincorporated into the main story, which is great, but familiar faces and good dialogue can't mask the fact that this game feels rushed. I feel as though after poor sales of the pre-sequel and questionable direction choices in Tales from the Borderlands led this addition to the series to be underfunded and underdeveloped. It feels as if this game wasn't playtested at all. There are artificial barriers that you would think would lead to secret areas with the chance of loot, but are just actual barriers. You look at a wall or a bundle of tree roots that are about knee high and think, yeah I can mantle over that, only for you to jump at it a thousand times until you realize it is just a wall and doesn't lead anywhere. There is also a near endless list of glitches and bugs, some of which resulted in game crashes, freight rate drops, freight rate, frame rate drops, and progress to be lost. These type of glitches, bugs, and locks are absolutely unacceptable for a full price AAA player versus enemy game that was in development since 2015. And I know that I said this already, but considering that Gearbox already had models for the characters, assets, textures, interactables, etc., I am shocked that a game with this large of a following and this much money behind it released in such a broken and unfinished state. Given how much of an a asshole Randy Pitchford is, how political the story was, and how broken the game is, I wouldn't recommend this game to anyone. It is so unfortunate that Borderlands 3 has many positive aspects to it, such as the leveling system, massive loot pool, and customization options, because it is the equivalent of a turd log spray-painted gold. It may look bright, shiny, valuable, and fun to play with, but it's still a fucking turd. $5 out of $60. Just play Skyrim. Hey, you. You're finally awake. On an unscripted final note, I have 100%ed Borderlands 3 at this point. Uh, all of the side missions are confirmed are pretty basic and boring. Just run up, hit X on something, uh, and then run back. None of it is as interesting as Borderlands 2. There is no good story writing in the side quests. 
on top of that, I feel like the game was short. I know that I said that in the video that I felt like that I had all of this content that I still had to finish, but it was just a matter of sitting down for another six hours and 100%ing all of the planets. Uh, by the time that you're level 50 and have Mayhem Mode unlocked, so long as you have a couple of good guns, a couple of good legendaries just from farming Grave Mind or Grave Ward or whatever his name is, you're fine and you'll finish the game with flying colors. It becomes easy peasy lemon squeezy. Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to mention. Oh yeah, uh, Gearbox did the absolutely unthinkable and decided to nerf Flak and buff other characters, which is a decision that makes absolutely no sense to me. I guess that they feel that Flak was oversaturating the game and that too many people were playing Flak and Zane instead of the other two characters, so they tried to nerf Flak, buff Zane a little bit, and buff the other characters to make them more on an even playing field. But I'm not going to go back and start another character from scratch because of these nerfs, and I feel like I've been completely alienated from Borderlands 3 because of this. I did not pick Flak because I knew that he was broken. I didn't watch any marketing content. I didn't watch any videos before I bought the game. I just picked it up because my friend said that they were going to play it, uh, and then they ended up not all except for one. But... I picked Flack because I wanted to have a pet, and I thought that he looked cool. That's it. Uh, and now I feel like I've been punished for picking Flack just, just because he happened to be the one character that Gearbox deemed overpowered. Uh, and it's a player versus enemy game, so if I'm level 50 and I have all of these guns and all of these multipliers, you don't need to nerf it, because the game's already the game's already out. It's already done. It's a single-player experience for the most part. It's not like... I will be hindering anyone else's gaming experience by having an overpowered character. I just think that it's stupid and that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and that that development time should have gone towards sending out massive patches for all of the glitches and bugs that are plaguing the game right now and are making it uh, barely playable. Uh, crashes are frequent, frame rate drops are constant, and I'll have a 20 minute video coming out highlighting some of these bugs that I found over the course of like, I think it was a, a six or a seven hour playthrough of the game. The, so just running through the story, we ran into soft locks, bugs, crashes, physics errors, etc. So be on the lookout for that. If you made it to the end, I congratulate you. Whether or not you sat through this all in one sitting or, you know, came back to skip through the pieces or just watched a couple of pieces and skipped to the end and wanted to see what the editor's note was. But uh, I hope you all enjoyed. Please subscribe if you did because I'll have more of this content coming out uh, as soon as I possibly can get it out. And have a good day.